Welcome. Uh, thrilled to have you all here. We uh, we started the Research Foundation in 1995 because I didn't believe that a doctor should do something to or put something in a patient that they either didn't know how it worked or what the outcome was or how to make it better. And so, so much of what we were doing in medicine was interesting, helpful, but really relatively primitive. And I always felt that there had to be a way to make almost everything that I touched better. And the only way to do that was to put solid science behind everything that we do. And the only way to do that is to have the team like you around us in order to look at everything we're doing, do solid outcome studies around it and understand, does it work? Does it not work? And how can we make it better? And so today I'd like to talk to you about some of the things we're doing in the foundation that we're excited about this year. There, there's too much going on for me to be able to go through everything, but I'd love to touch on some of the highlights and uh, share these with you. So <clears throat> fundamentally our vision is to accelerate healing. For instance, why does it take a year to come back from an ACL injury? To treat, prevent, and cure arthritis, enabling you to play forever. So that's our vision. I'd like to talk to you about how we're executing on that and um, go from there. So first of all, around every physician, there's a team. And every scientist, there's a team. And without that team, there's no way to execute. And so I'm thrilled and honored to work with the team that's here in the clinic and foundation with us today, as well as the folks who are online and that we work with remotely around the world. So uh, here, go back one. Here in the clinic, you guys have uh, met Mani Vassal, uh, who runs the research side of it from his wonderful PhD point of view and helps guide all the all the students and interns and folks who come and work with us all around. Dave Hopkins, who helps with all of our communications everywhere around the world. Lisa Evers, who's just joined us on the business side and development side. And many of you will probably get a phone call from her and hear from her to help us continue this work. And then the research and development team that's here in-house with Emma and Haley and Maya and Doral, who you also hear from on the development side, and Devika and Aliyah. We always have interns and students who are coming through as so much of what we do, we want to pass on to other folks to inspire them around this wonderful field of orthopedics and regenerative medicine and how to keep people young and how to keep them playing. But most importantly, also, we work with a team around the world, and that's the laboratory side of what we do. We can dream up techniques and we can uh, sometimes use them in people before we use them in sci scientific experiments, but ideally we want to test them all in various outcomes models in both animals and in the lab. And we're thrilled to be able to work with Tony Radcliffe uh, in San Diego. You're going to hear more about him through our funding through the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine that Monty will talk about in a minute. With Daniel uh, Grandy in New York who does lots of our bench science. So I send tissues from the operating room to Daniel. He can grow them in tissue culture. We can add stem cells and growth factors and exosomes and all the things that we're passionate about today in trying to help treat tissues and accelerate that healing part of our whole story. And in the lab, we can do a lot of sorting about you know, which growth factor is gonna make which cell and which tissue work better and grow faster and, and heal better in a, in a different way. We work with Mark DeCoster in Louisiana. He's doing a fantastic uh, concept where he puts little copper nanoparticles that cells can imbibe. And those of us who um, work with boats at all, as you, many of you know, I commute by boat to the office and we paint the bottom of our boat with copper paints because the copper kills everything. Moths won't grow to it and doesn't slow your boat down. So you would think that if we're putting copper nanoparticles into cells, it would kill them. But in fact, Mark discovered that if they're in nanoparticle size, they don't kill them. They stimulate the cell to produce extracellular matrix and they upregulate it. And so one of the questions we asked him was, could we take these copper nanoparticles and add them to our cartilage cells when we're working with a patient and doing a grafting and stimulate a bigger, more robust healing response. And so that's a study that we're doing with Mark. I send him tissues from the operating room and then he loads them in his lab and we look at the outcomes. Eventually these are all leading to 
very <clears throat> various kinds of personalized medicine which things will affect which person's cells in which different ways. Julie Rosser is in Austria, and we work with her, and we indeed ship tissue to Austria, which has been a trick that our team has had to work out. Uh, but she has a fantastic lab on a chip model where you can put tissues on a tissue plate, like under a microscope, and that plate has tons of little micro channels. And you can then add specific growth factors to each one of those channels and look at how the different cells of each person respond to different growth factors. So again, part of our whole picture of if we're going to be helping individuals heal faster, how do we how do we know which person's cells will respond to which factors? And we can test that in a lab on a chip model. And then David Frisbee is in Colorado. He's one of the world's leading horse veterinarians in the science side of the world. In this fall, we're going to be testing our cartilage pace graft model in his horse model, which is sort of a large animal model. We'll talk about that again a little bit more in a minute. So that's our worldwide collaborative team right now. And we'll go on to the next slide here. So let's focus on some of the individual programs. So first, let's look at BioNe. So biologic joint replacement is a concept that I was proud to help develop. Uh, and it's because we knew that when an athlete loses their meniscus cartilage, the shock absorber inside their knee, it dooms the knee. Even if they lose a small amount, they increase the force concentration across that tibial plateau and drive up the arthritis over time. And true, when they lose their ligaments and the knees are unstable, like a car tire that's out of line and wears out faster. And true, when they get a cartilage injury, it's called isolated chondral defect. It leads to the arthritis that we see later on. So we developed this concept of a biologic joint replacement. Could we replace each one of those tissues and save a person from having an artificial knee joint? And in fact, 80% of the people in the world who are told that they need to have an artificial total joint don't. They could either have a biologic replacement or if only one part of the joint is worn out, which is the most common presentation, they can have a partial joint replacement. Or if they need a full joint replacement, we've been working with companies in robotics in order to do these now without cement and permit our patients to get back to full sports. But let's talk for a minute about this whole bio knee concept that we've spent so much time developing and the research team is looking at the outcomes of every one of these uh, parts of this study. So just for everyone's knowledge base, when you look at a little diagram over there on the right, the articular cartilage is the surface on the end of bones, all bones crack open the chicken wing, that white shiny surface, that's articular cartilage. Your joint is five times as slick as ice on ice. And if you damage that articular cartilage, you drive up the friction and you wear out the surface. That's what arthritis is, the kinds that we treat. The meniscus cartilage is the shock absorber between those artic articular cartilage surfaces in the knee joint. And then the ligaments are what hold the joint together. So let's go on to the next slide here. We're able to get every one of those tissues and put them back in people's knees. And so, one of the questions we asked, which was unusual, we, back in 1995, 1995, we started transplanting the meniscus cartilage back into people's knees who had lost their meniscus. Usually the story is, I was playing high school soccer or football. I tore my meniscus cartilage. The doc went in and took it out. I played for years. I did great. And now I have arthritis. So the question was, can we put that meniscus cartilage back into people's knees and prevent that arthritis from happening. And in fact, we did that for a large number of patients. We presented that work around the world. Other people started doing it as well. It turns out that replacing the meniscus is a very important thing to do when people lose part of it in their knee joint. But the next question we asked is, what about all of our 50 to 70 year old patients who come to the clinic, they've got some arthritis, they're not so bone on bone, and they say, hey, isn't there just a shock absorber you can put back in my knee? Do I really have to go have a knee replacement now? You know, I'm doing pretty well. I'm not the worst case. Just buy me a few years and then I'll have my knee replacement when I'm older or my partial knee replacement when I'm older. So we did a study with the foundation team looking at all of the meniscus replacements that we do in patients over 50 years old who come in with knee joint arthritis. They have exposed bone. 
And so we combined our biologic joint replacement techniques where we would graft the articular cartilage and we'd put back a new meniscus and looked at that data and presented it this year. And it turns out that in patients over 50, they delayed the time in which they needed to have a joint replacement by an average of eight years. And 41% of the patients in this study so far have not gone on to have a knee replacement at all. And all of these patients were over 50, presented with joint arthritis, were told to have either a partial or total knee replacement, called us up and said, hey, is there some shock absorber you can put in my knee? We put a meniscus back in, did a biologic graft, articulate cartilage paste graft, and then followed the patients over the years. So we think we, by doing that and presenting this kind of data, we can make a significant change in people's lives and we can present the data around it. Now, next, <laughs> some patients lose their meniscus and say, hey, doc, if you take out some of it, I've heard that I'm going to get arthritis. Can't you just regrow it? And so that was my own story. I was out for a run with my mentor, Dick Stedman, back in 1986 when I was a fellow in Lake Tahoe. He looked at my bow legs. I'd had my meniscus taken out. He said, you're going to develop arthritis. If you want to make a contribution to orthopedics, figure out how to replace the meniscus. And so that's what got me started off in research and in meniscus cartilage research. And so in 86, I designed the collagen meniscus implant, which was a collagen scaffold designed to regrow the meniscus cartilage. And we took that study, that implant, through animal trials in 80, through the late 80s, into a human clinical trial, into a wide human clinical trial, and eventually it got approved by the FDA to be used around the world. Unfortunately, the scaffold that I designed in the late in the late 1980s was not really durable enough and not what I would design today. And so it's now off the market because surgeons found it too flimsy. They would break it when they would put it in. It would work well in some people, but not in others. And so one of the things we're going to be doing here is redesigning that collagen scaffold. Uh, hopefully we'll apply for grants to study that in animals and see if we can make a much more durable way of regrowing tissue in the knee joint. Next. So in addition to the, you know, the key part of that biologic joint replacement is regrowing the articular cartilage. The part that we talked about, it's five times as slick as ice on ice. It's what you get when you get arthritis. So in 1991, I had worked with Dick Stedman and looked at all of his microfractures where he'd go in and make little holes in the joint. And then while it worked well for some people, most people developed a fibrous tissue and it would fail after a few years. And so a lot of pro athletes had a microfracture procedure and then unfortunately didn't get through their whole career. So we said 91, we observed that when we're operating on someone's ACL, the cruciate ligament inside the knee, we would often widen the notch to give the new ACL more room. And it turned out that those notches always grew back in. And sometimes we had to go and widen them again. The other thing we observed is that the bigger the injury, the bigger the healing response. So kids would come in with these horrible ski injuries and uh, fractured joints, huge amount of blood in the knee. Those knees often healed better and with a more robust response than the ones that just had a little cartilage injury. So based on that, those observations, and also the observation that in the marrow, there were some marrow cells, which back then we didn't call them stem or progenitor or stromal cells, we just called them marrow cells. And we knew that they had the potential to heal. And the other thing we knew is that a guy named Salter had done a study that showed that when you apply motion to a healing tissue, it stimulates more normal collagen than if you put it in a cast, because remember in the 80s, all these joints were being put in casts after ACL surgery. So taking all of those observations, we created something called the articular cartilage paste graft, where we took bone and cartilage from inside the knee in the intercolor notch, took it out of the knee, smashed it into a paste, bloodied the arthritic defect with a super microfracture, really created a fresh fracture, packed the graft back into it, and followed the patients over time. And it turned out that many of them healed well, as you can see in that slide down there on the right. Uh, this is the technique of how microfracture is done, or how pace grafting was done, where we would fracture the cartilage lesion. We'd go ahead, harvest graft from the intercolor notch, take it out of the knee, smash it into a paste, pack the paste back in. 
And then I think you can highlight that lower side. We then published a sequence of papers of how, of how these patients did over time. And let me just show you one patient, next slide. So here's a young guy who unfortunately had a brain tumor diagnosed at age eight, underwent the appropriate therapy for the brain tumor, which created all kinds of negative effects for him and was put on growth factors in order to re-stimulate his growth. And unfortunately, that combination of drugs led to his articular cartilage in the joint to peel off. And he had these huge lesions of articular cartilage that you can see in the slide up on your right. So we saw him as a teenager. Uh, he had been told he could not play sports. Again, he developed a love for water sports because he could at least swim, even though he couldn't run or walk hike or do all the things his peers were doing. We saw him as a teenager. We did that articular cartilage graft. We then had a chance to look back in it at six months after surgery. And you could see the big hole in his knee in the upper slide and the healed tissue nicely in the lower slide. And he just came in last week. Uh, he's now a college student. He showed us that he was squatting 360 pounds in a squat. Uh, so it's a fantastic story of taking cartilage injury and young people regrowing it, saving their career. And we found that it works both in young people and old people. However, it doesn't work well enough. And many surgeons around the world have not adopted articular cartilage pace grafting as their primary technique, even though it's free, even though I can teach a surgeon anywhere in the world how to do it. It just has not gained the amount of acceptance that we think it should have. And part of the reason is, number one, surgeons have a hard time doing it. They want to put it in and see it like a perfectly grouted hole in the wall where you, they put it on like a toothpaste. And number two, they weren't confident of the data since it was a single site research program. So we applied to the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Vassal right now. They were, uh, this past year, awarded us a, a $1.1 million grant in order to push for the science. And let, let me turn this over for a minute and let him talk with you about that grant and how we're going to carry this, this work forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I am going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the details of what we're doing um, with some of the uh, uh, more uh, basic science on the discovery side, and also with uh, more translational, which would then take it to the animal modeling, and then before we go to the clinical trials. Um, uh, to step back, you know, we always try to uh, improve and enhance what we have and make it better. So we do know, of course, that the pace graph technique um, has had three decades of success, of course, but as science progresses and as science moves uh, forward, we also have to keep up with it. So on that note, the field of regenerative medicine has had immense uh, leaps and forward sort of uh, in the past two decades. And, and that's part of my background. So when I joined uh, the foundation five years ago, I uh, wanted to make sure that we keep up with that part. And of course, California is very lucky that we have California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, which is the stem cell agency. It's a granting agency. Um, it is the 800 pound gorilla in the space globally. And uh, it is, uh, so it's in, in terms of its credibility and, and what it has done for the field of regenerative medicine, it's just everyone knows um, internationally, of course. So we are lucky and we want to take advantage of this, of course, being here, right, in the hub. And um, consequently, we applied to a, one of the projects to enhance the spacecraft technique. We decided to partner up with our collabor uh, collaborative doctor, Anthony Rathcliffe down in San Diego, uh, who's uh, an amazing orthopedic scientist. And we applied for a grant uh, trying to enhance and augment the pace graph technique using the new regenerative medicine science and what we can now do to enhance it as a 2.0 version, if you will, right? So, and uh, we were lucky that we got this almost $1.2 million uh, for grant, uh, which is very hard to get. It's a 5% chance of getting it. We got it. And we are one year into the grant and it's a two-year uh, project. Already, we are seeing uh, uh, immensely positive results from this, uh, which is very encouraging. And 
uh, or of course we have a long-term trajectory. What we're doing is adding growth factors that are the positive juices as Dr. Stone talks about sometimes, uh, which can enhance and augment and expedite healing process. And in this case, of course, it's cartilage regeneration is what we're aiming for. And uh, we've characterized it in a, in a dish we have optimized it uh, using uh, mesenchymal stromal cells, which are quasi stem cells. They're not stem cells, but they are support cells that secrete these growth factors. And an adhesive and hydrogel that Dr. Anthony Ratcliffe has uh, proprietary technology on. And we are applying that now onto animal models. As you know, the progress of science, we have to depend on animal models that are as close, not quite, as it gets to the humans. And we're now at that juncture where we're actually trying to see how trying these on small animals and large animals will work. In parallel, we have received a very generous donation from one of our grateful patients in Canada um, that uh, has an interest in the equine world. And so the injuries that uh, we all suffer from in arthritis are not anything specific to humans. Of course, animals also suffer from these. And especially large animals, uh, and if you think of a horse or dogs that, you know, or even, you know, most of the animals, in fact, they do suffer from the same injuries. So we, of course, will have to go through the FDA regulatory pathway under their supervision um, to make sure that what we're doing is basically kosher with them and it is okay to move forward with. It is a, an incremental step-by-step -step process. It will take time. So what we're doing in parallel with our SARM grant, uh, we are meeting with the FDA in uh, the beginning of fourth quarter this year uh, to discuss our protocol. And we have already set in place the process for our collaboration with Dr. David Frisbee at Colorado State, who is one of the key world-renowned equine surgeons. And we are going to do a two-year study, um, basically replicating what we are doing right now with the CERM grant, the project that we're doing, and applying that in a large animal and in the horse in this case. And Tom O'Neill has, again, one of our um, leadership uh, uh, council members has generously donated the horses and has enabled this project to be expedited a little bit faster than it would have normally. So the, in two years, hopefully, we're gonna stand here and we will, uh, or maybe even a year, and uh, uh, give you an update on where we are with that, where we're adding, again, to the paste in the horse, in the cartilage, uh, the hydrogel, which is an adhesive, basically agent that will keep the paste in place better. Uh, then, you know, for and, and, and that's something that surgeons would want, of course, um, to make it more successful and adding various growth factors such as mesenchymal stromal cells to it to see if it, we can augment it and expedite the cartilage regeneration in the large model. And on that note, um, so that's the total thing. So again, it's a big circle. They all link and it's a cohesive thing pathway in our pipeline. And uh, we appreciate your support and enthusiasm. In our, in our progress. I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Stone to discuss one more arm of our pipeline on the testosterone side. And all that. That's all to you. Thank you, Monty. I also want to call out the Millers who have so generously supported that work from Canada and, uh, and really made it possible for us to move on through this um, large animal model. So now let's talk about another really one that's close to my heart. <laughs> so if you ask a patient, what was the worst thing about their knee surgery? They rarely remember the pain. They almost always remember the muscle atrophy that took them a year to recover from. And whether they're an athlete or a policeman or in the military, anywhere, that atrophy, that requirement to go back to lots of physical therapy and gym workouts just to overcome that muscle loss is a significant disability and problem for people around the world. And what happens is that when I hit you with an ax, and otherwise known as surgery, you have a huge cortisol release. And that cortisol binds your muscle receptors. And within eight hours of surgery, the muscle atrophy process starts. And so the question we asked was, if we could bind those muscle receptors with a long-acting testosterone just before surgery, could we stop a certain percentage of that muscle atrophy? And so due to the um, 
donation of a favorite and kind group of patients from Ken and Anna's ankle, we, we have the ability to carry out this study. And the study is that we're giving patients just before surgery uh, a dose of long-acting testosterone, going through measuring their thigh girth by uh, measurement and by MRI, and then a month later, giving them another dose and then following them out over three to six months. And we completed the first 15 patients of the uh, pilot study where uh, they're in a pilot, you're looking to make sure that it's safe to do, and it was. We're now looking to do the final 80 patients to see whether or not it's efficacious and solves the problem. So that study, we've completed the pilot. We're uh, going to start the wide clinical trial or the larger clinical trial as soon as we have funding for that. And uh, by next year, we hope to be able to report to you what the outcomes are of, of that, that real study. Next. So it's not enough for us just to do work here and to carry out this work. What's really important for us is to communicate around the world, to teach doctors and scientists everywhere about what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how it can affect them and their patients. And so in that regard, I run around the world and give lectures. We write papers and posters and really try to communicate through the web all the science that we're doing and try to influence people around the world. A big part of the techniques that we're doing, the PACE graft, meniscus transplant, eventually collagen regeneration, doesn't require any specific unique instrumentation or corporate support. One of the missions that we have been involved in is can we teach developing physicians in developing countries how to do these regenerative medicine techniques and make it available to them? So part of our global mission uh, is both teaching but also engaging with physicians around the world to be able to deliver this kind of care. Next. So let me introduce two friends of the foundation and have them tell their stories. So we'll start with Andy Haynes. Go ahead. You there? Hi, I am here. Can you hear me okay? Yes? Okay. Um, I, um, in 2001, I, yeah, 2001, I was diagnosed with articular cartilage transplantation. And I went to numerous um, different orthopedic uh, surgeons trying to find uh, the best way to move ahead because I'm a teacher and I'm very active. And this was a complete hit to my lifestyle. Um, so what I did is I went to multiple surgeons and they all had the same sort of response and that is we're going to put in um, a cadaver part of some animal um, and put that into your knee and I must have seen six or seven different doctors and they all basically had the same response so I researched a little bit more and found Dr. Stone in San Francisco and the reason I chose to go with him is because his technique seemed innovative and least invasive, um, most progressive thinking, um, using my own body materials. And I could get back on my bike and start doing all of my activities um, as soon as possible. So literally, it happened very fast. I had the diagnosis. I did some research. And then I had it done in December of 01. Um, I was a nerd about following the protocol afterwards. And I think that that is a big part of why my healing has gone so well. Um, I was non-weight bearing for 30 days, literally had to learn how to walk again. Um, I did the CPM machine every single day. Um, I did the electric stim machine every single day. Um, I was... I started my PT um, and I did that continuously. I mean, I really was a nerd about it. Um, and I was back on my bike, I'd say by February. After that one month off, um, and that was a difficult month, but I, I can't afford to not have the use of my knee. So I got back on uh, my bike in February. And then I think for the next, um, the next year or so, 
I would check in with Dr. Stone. He would call and check in with me. Um, I'd ask silly questions. Can I do this movement? Can I do this movement? And he would say yes or no. And I was in touch with the PT team at Stone Clinic. Um, I kept taking my glucosamine chondroitin, um, uh, my joint juice stuff, um, and just being very proactive about following the, the suggested protocol for recovery. Um, and then for, I'd say the next five years or so, um, I added more stuff, um, more activities. I, at that time I was riding my bike, maybe a hundred miles a week, commuting to work to and fro on my bike. Um, and then I would add um, benefit rides on the weekend, um, slowly incorporated a little bit of running. And then um, I moved to uh, an even more active area than North County, San Diego, and um, to the Southern Sierras, and then incorporated um, more river activities. So that included um, river trips um, in Alaska, Colorado, California, um, so that uh, I'd say more sports related activities, um, rock climbing, I added snowboarding, kind of went back to what I was doing before. And then eventually over time, um, kind of forgot about a knee injury. So by 2014, somebody said, do you want to do a triathlon? So that's when I said, sure, I'll give it a try. Cause I, by that time I had incorporated swimming and so swim, bike, run sounds great. 2014, I entered my first sanctioned uh, try and it was fun and I did sort of well. So uh, ever since then, I've been participating, competing in triathlons and I um, usually win my age group. Um, I have had another injury since then. And um, Dr. Stone said, when I was sitting on the table, he said, I think we've seen you in here before for a knee injury, which knee was it? And I said, I couldn't tell you, I, I, I don't know. So um, I was riding this morning, 30 miles, and I don't have any um, issues with my knee. It is wonderful. And I, I don't know what else to say. Alexandra, great, great story. Just one last question. How many tries have you done? Uh, solid since 2014. Um, what is that? Eight or nine? Eight, uh, I usually do one solid um, try in the central California area. So I definitely have done it. 14, 15, 15, 15. So eight or nine, eight or nine. And then uh, overall woman, the, the, the specific one I've been doing has been um, growing in popularity because of the location and it's just a beautiful, it's a beautiful uh, setup. Um, so it's getting more competitive and I can say that um, as time's gone on, I have probably placed in the top 20 of women, um, um, top 10 earlier for women, but yeah, it's been about that long. So we're very proud of you. So it's, it's the story of people who are told that they can't return to impact sports and they can, if we can get them to regrow their cartilage and do that well. Thanks. Let's go on and go to Chris Hartley. Chris, are you there? Back on. Okay. Uh, if Chris chimes in, we'll put her on. Otherwise, we'll open up for questions. So just remember to unmute yourself there um, and speak up if you want to. I'm not hearing anyone there. Is 
Uh, good go. afternoon, Dr. Stone and fellow audience. Um, I'm, I'm a 64 year old female that's had repeat scar surgery, uh, sorry, repeat uh, orthopedic surgery for scarring, uh, some of which was obtained through, uh, you know, PT, where they tell you to kind of act like a sports uh, uh, participant. And so the history there at this point now, I'm 64 almost bone on bone, maybe one of those candidates for, I, I guess I'm curious, can I be a candidate for regrowth? And then um, I have nerve damage now from so many surgeries on one knee. Are you able to help me with that? Am I on mute or can you hear me? Um, yes, I can. There you go. So clearly I need to see your x-rays and MRI to give you good advice. I don't want to give you bad advice. But what I will tell you is that the injections that we're doing these days of PRP and HA are potently anti-inflammatory, anti-fibrotic, meaning they inhibit scar tissue formation. And so in many of the patients that we've been treating who have problems with scarring, these anabolic injections, rather than stimulating more scar tissue to form, inhibit the scar tissue quite a bit. The future is that we will be using more and more birth tissues, the Wharton's jellies of the world, because they're extremely potently anti-fibrotic, anti-inflammatory, uh, they're immunomodulatory, which is why the mother does not reject the fetus, even though the fetus is only one half the mom. And so these tools that we now are getting access to being able to use, we will be testing and refining to figure out what's the right combination of injections to use to both decrease scarring, but to also stimulate as an anabolic to accelerate healing. So happy to look at your situation directly, just you know, write to me at the clinic and um, happy to look at that individual question. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so the you have those circles of five or six sort of priority areas or, or where you're to a certain level. Uh, so just to say, because I can remember the one that we're talking with, uh, which is kind of preempting uh, post-surgery atrophy. So I'm curious and might differ from one to the other, but are there other organizations that you respect, you know, medically, uh, that are also working on these things or that tend to be unique? Uh, and if there are, are you guys joining up or is there a competition on grants or how is that, how does that work? So that was Ken asking that question. And I think I mentioned earlier, Ken and Anna were huge supporters of, our, of this testosterone study. So not just that in general. Yep. The other ones, yeah. So the answer is yes. These questions are being asked now around the world. We happen to have been very early in this process in the biologics and regenerative medicine because I started in the 1980s when people weren't really thinking about this as much, but we are joined by labs around the world. So the places that I mentioned to you that we collaborate with are active research centers. The, our collaborator, Tony Radcliffe at UCSD, it's an active center of looking at biologics as are other places. I just came back from the Isikos conference, which is a big international conference that this year was held in Boston. And I travel around the world to other meetings where there is really an active regenerative medicine program. Everywhere in the world, people have heard of stem cells. And many of you on this call today may have had stem cells taken from your fat or your bone or injected into your different tissues. Some of you have even had them injected into your faces. And while you all look very beautiful on the Zoom, it turns out that injecting cells is not the best way to do it. It turns out that every one of you on the Zoom and in this room have billions of stem cells within your body. They're called pericytes. They live on the walls of vessels. And the most potent way to accelerate healing is to inject recruitment factors that cause your own body's native cells to divide into stromal and progenitor cells, rush to the site of injury, and be the professorial cell that engages and directs how that healing goes. 
And it's much more potent than injecting a few million cells from one site or another, which unfortunately only lasts a short time and often die. So all of you who have rushed off to the Cayman Islands and Mexico and other places to get your cells harvested and injected, I would tell you that it's far better to stay here and figure out which recruitment factors mobilize your own body's stem cells to institute that repair process. Would you close that door, please? So I hear Christine Hartley's, uh, Chris Hartley's voice What's now. That noise? So I'm going to turn it, turn it over to Chris for a minute, and uh, then we'll answer more questions afterwards. So Chris, welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yep. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I'm not the super athlete, but I am a very active uh, over 70 year old woman who, uh, and chair of the leadership council of the Stone Research Foundation, which is a group of sustaining donors who, whose philanthropy and business expertise assist in supporting many aspects of Dr. Stone's research. I first became aware and intrigued by the science of regenerative growth mechanisms in joint healing and repair during a presentation such as this uh, given by Dr. Stone. And living in the Mountain West, I try to be active year round and lead an active lifestyle in many of the places that we visit and uh, across the United States and in our travels and have personally benefited from these scientific findings and treatments and program of rehab, which is key offered by the Stone Clinic. Being a retired healthcare professional, I quickly understood the possibilities of applying the scientific findings into real-time health interventions and care, and Dr. Stone's data and proven record of applying the science over the past 35 years to the interventions which sped healing, in my case, from having my meniscus repair bundled with my own cells, speeding the healing along, absolutely no pain. It was the Tuesday before Thanksgiving in, the, in San Francisco and partially weight bearing on crutches. I was able to go to dinner with my family on Thanksgiving day, two days later. Um, so being personally involved in uh, the fruits of that healing and repair and recovery and staying active convinced me to come on board and be a small part of a very exciting frontier of, of joint repair. Often underappreciated, underappreciated, the impact of this research is underestimated. And it's often said that death and taxes are inevitable, but none of us avoid the phenomenon of injury, inflammation, and in many cases, atrophy and repair. Repair that can now be enhanced because of Dr. Stone's specific, unique methods and techniques and my meniscus repair has been over 10 years ago, and ever, or about 10. And ever since then, I've skied 100 days plus downhill skiing every year. I'm excited to think about the future of this kind of treatment, not only restorative, but preventative, in which it may be possible to put arthritis in our rear window. And that excites me, and I hope it excites you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Christine. Um, and, I, and thank you for the compliments. But but I have to tell you that I think what we're doing is primitive. I wish that we were much better. And I'm driven to make what we're doing much better. And as, as Chris referred to, you know, we like to say cancer may kill you, but arthritis ruins your life. And I see people every day with that story. And I'm driven to see how we can solve that. And it's your guys' support that makes this work. And it's the objective analysis by the research team that looks at everything we're doing now and says, does this work or does this not work? Or how do we make this work better? And I think that's the, the fun of what we do, the challenge of what we're doing, and it's what drives us every day. So appreciate your listening, appreciate your support. I'll open up one more time. Are there any last questions? Otherwise, we'll... We'll say goodbye to all of you and, and keep you in touch. We're, we have a whole communications team here with Dave Hopkins running that and making sure that we reach out to all of you and communicate what we're doing and what we're excited about. Uh, we love telling patient stories because 
people like Annie, you know, just excite us. And she's being very humble. She's won an incredible number of events in her age group and, and with a knee that was otherwise destroyed. And so, you know, these are things that turn us on. So any other questions from the team or from the group? One um, quick question. Yeah. Oh. Please. Uh, in, in your comment with injection cell or uh, injecting stem cells and instead injecting recruitment factors, were you referring to PRP type uh, recruitment factor therapy? And where do you see that in the in the process? Yes, exactly. So we're doing lots of PRP plus hyaluronic acid injections. I have patients with absolutely horrible looking knee x-rays who come in once or twice a year and usually just before ski season and we do a combination of PRP HA injection for them and they go off and ski the rest of the ski season and uh hey doc I'll let you fix my knee when these injections wear off is a very common story we're hearing but they don't work for everybody and they're not quite as potent as we'd like them to be and so we did a prospective double-blind randomized control study here of PRP and HA plus other factors, which gave us information about how these things work. And we'd like to expand that work because clearly you have the ability to regenerate tissue, not just accelerate healing within you. The salamander knows how to do it. The little baby in utero knows how to do it. Children, if you cut off the tip of their, or they cut off the tip of their finger by accident, often will regenerate that tip and you tend to lose it as you age. So we know you have the genetics, we know you have the cells, and it's our job to unlock that combination for the various tissues and stimulate your ability to heal. So for right now, the short answer to your question is PRP plus HA is an effective tool. The longer part of this is I know we can do better. Tool for arthritis, or more for men and or and or meniscus. Um, Sorry, it's a tool for, for reducing inflammation, reducing pain, recruiting cells. We do not have evidence that our PRP HA injection causes tissue healing. So, on the positive side, the joints feel so much better. On the negative side, am I just permitting my patient to destroy their joints? Um, and it's a real question. Uh, we want to get good enough where we can inject something that will actually stimulate a healing response in a reproducible way. And we just don't have that data yet. Dr. Stone? Yeah. Um, there's a, a question in the chat about the testosterone therapy, which is whether it can be used both for females and males. And then a second question about that um, what is the projected timeline, assuming that the you have a successful outcome uh, in the testosterone uh, project? Like, how many years would it be before it would be applicable to everyone? Sure. So here's the barriers. It's about ten thousand dollars per patient to complete that trial. We need another eighty patients to complete it. So as soon as we're funded, we'll launch that part of the start of that trial most likely will take one to two years to complete uh, all 80 patients. Uh, then we process the data, submit it to the FDA and submit it to the various companies um, and look for an approval. And in this case, since those drugs are approved, it would be looking for an approval for a new indication. Uh, obviously it could be used off label, but the idea is to get a drug company to that where we test their long acting testosterone to turn our data over to the FDA and say, hey, here's the data that it's safe. Here's the data that's effective. We want an indication to use this to prevent atrophy. So that's the process we will go through over the next window of time. And it can be used for males and females? So we're only testing in males right now because of all the, all the history of testosterone. But my suspicion is there's no reason why a short acting, and it's only a month uh, of drug therapy, uh, couldn't be used in women as well. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, I think I saw you light up there for a minute. Yes, thank you. I um I wanted to uh, toss my two cents in here for for those of you don't who don't know me. I'm also a physician, um, and I do um, some high end cutting work in in uh, interventional radiology. Um, I want to say, I mean, I've said this to Dr. Stone, but I want to say this uh, more publicly that. I'm um, I'm incredibly impressed by what Dr. Stone has been able to accomplish and what he's done with for what you've been able to accomplish is 
like there are people who have a lot of resources and accomplish very little. Um, and there are others who have relatively few resources and, and accomplish a, a tremendous amount with those resources. And, and you're definitely in that camp. And I, uh, I mean, this is an area of medicine where I, as a physician, um, feel like it's, I mean, it should be criminal that we've spent so little money as, you know, as a country, as a, as a field in the area of this sort of research, the, um, the, the areas where, where we in medicine have been spending money on, um, in arthritis have, have been, I mean, they're driven by entities that have agendas that aren't really looking out for the best interests of the patients and having a physician and scientist researcher like you, who's fighting for what's best for the patient who's sitting in front of you, um, you're few and far in between and I, and we should do everything we can to support you. Um, I hope you're not a dying breed, but it, but the younger doctors, I don't see that same level of expertise and drive and sense of sacrifice to accomplish these things. And um, so, as I've told you before, you're not allowed to retire anytime soon. <laughs> and um, and I think we should all do what we can uh, to support this work that you're doing. It, it, it's truly phenomenal. Um, I flew in from another state, had to be treated by Dr. Stone and um, and if I ever need anything else, believe me, you're, you're the only one who's touching my knee. <laughs> Thanks so much, Art. And to one of your points, though, a, a big part of our mission is teaching. And so we have uh, young fellows and residents and uh, volunteers come through the clinic. Uh, my job is to inspire them that the, the fun and the satisfaction of medicine is, uh, goes along with the science of medicine. And just feeling the way I feel, which is that everything I touch I'm thinking about how do we make it better? How do I do this better? How do I do every procedure better? The, the verbiage that there's, oh, this is just a routine, whatever, drives me crazy because nobody's routine and nobody's tissue ever presents in a, exactly the same way and their desires and their athletic goals and their physiology and everything about them, you know, they're unique. And so I'm thinking at each moment, how do I fix this for that person? And then how do I fix it better than I've ever been able to do it? And then what tools do I need to make that even better? And that's where the whole research side of it comes in as well. So the fun and the sport and the satisfaction of this part of medicine goes hand in hand with science. And I was, I'm hoping that everybody who comes along or comes through here feels that energy and that enthusiasm. And, uh, and that's what we're trying to infect people with. And in some ways, also for our patients, I often say I'm a drug pusher because I'm pushing adrenaline, testosterone, pheromones, all the all the good feelings, all the all the wonderful thing, drugs that you naturally get out of exercise, and if I can help people get back to exercise, then I think we're doing the right thing. Almost all of the longevity data that you're looking at today, whether it's metformin, whether it's you know pick your drug or pick your science that makes a worm live longer, every single one of those studies shows results that are equal to what a patient gets from an hour of exercise. And so our ability to keep every one of you exercising every day uh, will keep your longevity going as well as your lifelong satisfaction. That uh, that joy and that passion that um, that I'm I know you're instilling in the people in the the medical professionals, the physicians who rotate through your clinic. The I mean, one of the problems is that as those people go out to a work for a group or work for a hospital, then they get pressured into caring about things that aren't necessarily what's in the best interest of the patient. And that becomes their focus more than uh, more than developing, you know, in instituting and implementing this these techniques. And the, because if the hospital's not going to make money from it and the group's not going to make money from it, then and there's no CPT code and they're not generating RVUs then they're not going to get the support from the group or the hospital to, to implement these methods. And that's why I'm so glad that you've remained independent so that you can do what's in the best interest of the patients and you don't have that same level of, of pressure in that way. Um, getting these things reimbursed by insurance or supported, I mean, that's a, that's a whole separate question. Now, those of us who are fortunate to be able to 
pay for it out of pocket. That's wonderful and great. And I'm so glad that you offer it. Um, I, I, it just, it kills me inside that there, that there are people who, um, that this isn't offered wide. This is, this isn't offered much more widely. And the reason and understanding the reason behind why it's not offered much more widely, it, it, it it's incredibly frustrating. So I'm, I'm glad that you're able to pull it off, you know, and stay independent and, and offer these things, how you can then eventually cause a shift in the wider medical system. Now that's, that's a, that's a heavy lift, but I think you're doing everything you can and everything that can reasonably be done. I think you're doing it. And, and so hats off to you. Keep up the good fight. <laughs> Thanks so much. Anyone else popping in there? I see Tom Turk on the line there. <laughs> Okay, great. Listen, I want to thank all of you for listening to us today, and I, I hope we've inspired you to come join us, um, take all the help we can get. And uh, my job is to keep you playing, playing forever, dropping dead at age 100, playing the sport you love. Uh, so take care. Have a great week. Bye-bye.